Thanks, Rose. Um, as Rose said, I'm Neil McCarthy with RMC Architects. I am on the steering committee of the Alliance, and I'm representing uh, local architects. I see some of my colleagues here uh, in the audience, and uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, today's presentation is about density and design done right. And uh, this stems from uh, one of the goals of the Alliance, and that's we're trying to find solutions uh, for housing affordability and diversity. Um, so it, as part of that task, we look to other communities to see how they engage that issue and some other solutions that we, we see. Uh, some of those that you may be familiar with uh, uh, it may include Portland, which is with their efforts to uh, add duplex and row housing into single family zoning. Um, in Seattle, we're seeing efforts to increase uh, the use of ADUs. That's kind of been prominent in the news. And one of the other examples that, uh, that's been uh, made the news lately is uh, Minneapolis, where they've essentially eliminated single family zoning. It's a big move. And uh, they've done that not only uh, about housing affordability, but also on issues of equity and diversity. So uh, if you haven't uh, seen that before, I would encourage you to look it up. It's a pretty interesting uh, process that they've gone through and interesting results. So uh, today we're going to be hearing uh, more about what's happening north of the line, Vancouver, BC. For some reason, that border tends to stop the flow of information sometimes. So. Um, we've got Michael Mortensen here uh, from Vancouver, and he'll be our featured presenter. Uh, but before we hear from Michael, uh, Rick Seppler's joined us today. Uh, Rick is the director of the planning and community development uh, for the city of Bellingham, and uh, he's uh, uh, offered to make uh, you know a, a few remarks before we begin. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, before I bring Rick up, I'm going to uh, give some more information about Michael. Uh, Michael is the director of the Livable City Planning Firm up in Vancouver, BC. Uh, it's a private development uh, firm uh, that specializes in uh, urban planning, and uh, they work throughout BC uh, and also in, uh, in the United Kingdom, from what I understand. Uh, Michael's passion is planning and planning liv livable cities, and it's reflected both in his professional work and in his community work. Uh, one of the interesting uh, associations that Michael's a director of is uh, Urbanarium, and if you get a chance, Google that. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating think tank uh, up in Vancouver, BC, that tackles many different planning issues, and it's on kind of the cutting edge of of what's happening uh, with issues that, that we'll be talking about today. Um, current livable city projects include, include working with private sector developers uh, on m uh, building mixed-use residential-led projects and working with public sector organizations like BC Housing. Uh, BC Housing is currently working on the redevelopment of underutilized affordable housing sites. Uh, so that's a big task. Prior to establishing uh, livable cities up in Vancouver, Michael worked with uh, Grosvenor, which is an international development firm. Uh, he started his work in Vancouver and then moved over to London. And then I understand Brexit impacted a decision to move back, so uh, Michael may share something about that. Um, in his work with Grosvenor, he was leading the development of sustainable, purpose-built, mixed-use residential communities at scale. Uh, and rental communities. Uh, prior to that, uh, Michael was a major projects planner at the city of Vancouver, so he's seen the issue from the uh, public side as well. And uh, Michael uh, is a adjunct professor at UBC's uh, School of Business in their MBA program. And today, Michael's gonna share some perspectives on the Vancouver experience uh, discussing solutions uh, such as transit-oriented development, brownfield redevelopment, and the missing middle. So, Rick, let's start with uh, some remarks from you, and then we'll transition to Michael. Thank you.
So while the audiovisual kicks in, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in Densely Done Right. Um, you can imagine as a planner, it's rare that I get called to the Densely Done Wrong conferences. <laughs> Though I, I think it'd be so simple, you know, if we just flatten artist point, we could put a strip mall in there. It'd be so easy. Um, I'd like to just chat with you a little bit about uh, what's happening here in Bellingham, talk a little bit about some of the uh, context we work in, um, and sort of begin with a general understanding that um, Bellingham is not unique um, in terms of its housing demands. It is unique in terms of character, in terms of its population, and perhaps unique in the ability to try to solve some of the issues that others have faced and still have the opportunity to solve it successfully. You know, uh, folks often isolate Bellingham and Whatcom County and say, these are problems that a couple of simple changes will change. I, I wish it were the case. This is a very complex calculus with many levers that need to be pulled. And the growth issues we're feeling are symptomatic of growth throughout Washington State. You know, the Office of Financial Management that does the projections for population for Washington tells us that by 2040, 33 million more people will come to this state. 33 million. That's like saying the current population of Seattle, Tacoma, and Spokane add a complete another one of each of those cities. And we see that here. In Bellingham, we see about 1,400 people coming every year. And they'll be continue to come into the future. And that creates a significant demand on our housing supply. And it prompts the need for us to work together to find those kind of solutions to address it. So that's why we're here today. That's what we do every day at the city, trying to find a way to, to advance uh, solutions that fit us just right, that provide those kind of opportunities. I think one thing that's underscoring it on the West Coast and in Washington, and certainly in Bellingham and Whatcom County, is there has been a significant change in the paradigm. Um, our most significant issue that we face and other communities in Washington face is that since um, roughly around 2000, we've seen a significant increase in the cost of land, and that's reflective of significant population demand, folks moving here. Land values have gone up 64%, 67% in Seattle and in Whatcom County. And the challenge for us is our wages have not kept pace with that, and that creates the disconnect. That disconnect is very um, uh, real in the sense that folks aren't able to capitalize to buy as much. Uh, the market becomes much more competitive. Um, and we have a shortfall on housing options for folks that they can actually afford and not be unburdened. And what causes this? Well. A couple of things. If you look at the numbers um, between the Great Recession and just about three years ago, we weren't building. I think all of you in this room who are involved in the industry know that. Um, it was pretty darn quiet. And the reason was is that the economy stopped. We weren't building product. But during that period, we still had significant in-migration. Folks kept moving here. They kept coming. And I'm going to say one thing that is one of the great untruths is folks say it's all those college students. You know, the number of college students haven't changed from before the Great Recession till today. And if you extract them from the market, they're not the ones causing the problem. Nor is it speculative development, quite frankly. It's a fundamental disconnect between um, the, the fact that we didn't build, there's a significant gap between our income and our home prices, and one thing that's really important, what's driving all that immigration? This is a great place to live. We have a robust economy. We are one of those areas that if you look at the national maps in terms of climate change that are to be spared, uh, we have the least amount of change, and we're extraordinarily desirable. Those factors combined create tremendous pressure on our housing market. So I wish there was a magic bullet. You know, as we've said to council, if there was one thing we could do that would just change all of these factors, we'd do it. Because we sure as heck have looked at everything, and we will continue to look at everything. What I can say is the city is a player in this, right? We control zoning and permits. And yes, we could do better in terms of timeliness. We could be more generous in terms of what we permit under our zoning. We could find innovative solutions, and we work every day to work and advance those. Um, and we can deal with um, property taxes to some degree. Um, we can ask less of folks. Um, but at that point, we're just deferring the cost to someone else unless we fairly assess it. So we have to be thoughtful about we want the services we need to pay for. 
The challenge that comes up, and I think the most profound one on that, is how much we don't control. Affordability, if there is a 1% change in the mortgage rate, it makes a significant effect on our entire city in terms of who can afford housing. That's something we don't control, but that's beyond our, our pale. But we have to adjust to it, and we have to provide choices to respond to those changes as best we can. There are a number of things that are out there that are part of the solution. All of you are part of the solution, as well as government and us. So we have a number of strategies we've advanced to try to do this, and we've had some traction. You know, we went from a near 0% vacancy rate in our multifamily to about 2.7% vacancy rate right now. Um, that's right above the state average in terms of multifamily. That's showing that all of the units that have been permitted over the last three years have come online, meeting in, in uh, demand from in-migration and catching up a bit. What's a healthy vacancy rate? Well, the economists tell us about 6%, so we have quite a ways to go. So we have seen some progress in those areas. We have to make the most of our infrastructure, all right? Um, one of the challenges are, and it's kind of a simplistic model, if we just let folks keep building out into the countryside, we can make housing less affordable. Remember, drive till you can afford your mortgage payment. Um, that's really good, but it means that all of you, all of you will be paying the cost for their savings, right? We have a four minute response time for our fire services. Four minutes, that's guaranteed in a sense when you come into the city. If we have areas out in the hinterland, that means new stations, that means new facilities, it means more firefighters. We have a response time for our EMS services as well as for our police. Those are the high urban services we like. The further we go afield, the more expensive it is to serve it. And you might say, you know, the developers build the roads and they have a 20-year guarantee. After 20 years, it's conclusive. It's two and a half times more expensive to serve on the fringes than closer in. For all of us, the cost recovered from that development won't cover the cost of services that need to be provided. So we have to build where we have our services, and we have to take advantage of the infrastructure we have. And I will say something that's really important um, from our perspective. If you have density without amenity, you might as well just do sprawl. What that means, if you have density without parks, without places for people to go, without the things of proximity to school and services, if you don't have that, cramming people together, you might as well do sprawl, it's probably better. Okay. We also have to be thoughtful about where multifamily development is allowed, and I think that's one of our great challenges. Um, in a sense, multifamily is everything. It's a rubric that includes everything from common wall construction townhouses straight onto uh, multifamily complexes with hundreds of units. What we see and what the solution is, is that missing middle. Those are those units that fit in neatly between a single family detached house to a common wall single family house, to a row house, to a quadplex that could be built at a scale and character that could fit into any of our neighborhoods successfully. And quite frankly, here's the hidden secret. Walk around our historic neighborhoods and you'll see those units there already. That's the way we used to provide housing choice. We've stopped doing that, we need to go back to it. So what are we gonna to do to make this happen? The first is the infill toolkit. We have 43 completed projects that were done. We have permits for 501 more in, 501. So we made significant inroads on that. Those are the units we just talked about, the duplex, the triplex, the small house, the cottage. Those are more affordable. If you only build two of them, they'll get bid up in this marketplace. They won't be affordable. But if we build 200 or even 2,000, we can provide enough choice to get those units on the ground. Our urban villages have been remarkably successful, though somewhat uneven. In our urban villages, what we do is we allow those areas, we're gonna put our capital investments, we have the infrastructure in place, they're in close proximity to transit, they're close to schools, they're close to shopping, they're close to jobs. Um, if we can see continued growth in our villages, we can see a way of providing, and it's by choice. Folks go there because it's cool to be close to the things you're close to. Folks have shown that they want to be closer in and have access to those amenities. Um, and the ADU ordinance. Um, we're very pleased after a laborious process, um, which did not involve um, 
killing a goat and reading the entrails, but should have, I think, at some time, we were able to establish the ADUs both detached and attached throughout the city. And thanks to a number of faces here who participated through that process, it provides a reason choice in our community for aging in place, for folks who are starting out, and folks at the end of their life cycle who don't need their big homes. And we've seen tremendous response in the city. I think there's over 90. Uh, Chris, how many have applied? Yeah, I think so. 82. Yeah, 82 units since that ordinance came in. And proportionately for a town of 100,000, which is roughly where we are with our UGA, that's pretty good as a start. Um, we need to spur our multifamily tax development, and we've used the multifamily tax exemption with great success. We've gotten units on the ground, and again, we've made a chance to go from 0% multifamily vacancy, literally, up to 2.7. Um, so it is working, and we are achieving headway on that. And I think the thing is, our, where do we go from here? You know, we have a, much work to do. There's a significant challenge ahead of us. Um, the first is we have to make sure our existing zoning is working. You know, before you contemplate changes, and you know, Minneapolis is very progressive to do that. Um, you need to read the full text of their ordinance and the uh, caveats that went in in terms of what can be built and where. Um, it's a sound bite, I think, to say they eliminated it completely, because that's not quite truthful, nor did Oregon when they passed the statewide initiative. What they did largely is allow more of the infill toolkit types to be constructed in neighborhoods, and that's something we're pursuing too. Um, but we want to make sure our existing zoning works first, and that we maximize it, and we don't lose opportunities, because some of it is spot on. When we did an assessment we presented to council uh, about two weeks ago, we looked at where our services were. We looked at where our amenities were. And we found out that much of our zoning matches that. That's really successful and good. But we weren't realizing the development we wanted to. We've got to crack that nut and make sure we get it. And the th second is um, permitting will never be as fast as folks like. I, I wish that were true. That's one of the uh, laws, in, in, uh, laws of planning, is that no matter what we do, we're not going to be fast enough, but we're going to keep trying. Um, our permitting is challenging. Our codes are complex. They're complex because we care a lot about the communities. We've got to find ways of being faster, and we're committed to doing that. We reassess annually. We involve members of the community. We try to make our permitting process um, as predictable as possible. Um, it is a challenging process, not just here, but elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, implementing our current zoning, one thing we're looking on is our residential multi-zoning. This is zoning that was designed from its onset to have duplex, triplex. They're well situated. They're on go lines. They're near shopping. They're near schools. Except that we've seen a propensity in our community to use up that land for single family development. Single family is permitted in the residential multi. And that has been the choice. Um, if you preclude what we're looking for, we're going to get something else. So I think in a sense, we have to really encourage what we're looking for. And that's a change we're investigating right now with the city council by their direction. Can we require the uh, types of units in those areas and not accept single family in those areas? And my battery is running low, but that's okay. There we go. Um, we are working to um, streamline in our urban villages the permitting process. We understand that one of the great drawbacks is we all care about the quality of the built environment. We care about good design and high design values, but our process has been um, less predictable than we'd like. We want it more clearly communicated early on and we are committed to working on design review um, because that's the key. Um, as you'll no doubt hear from Michael, design is the key to solving density. Good design can accommodate density in areas without the perception of huge bulk and mass and loss of character and scale. Um, we're moving forward from other recommendations in terms of the urban village status report. We're looking to change the floor area ratio in Fountain to encourage, uh, incentivize a little bit more development that better suits that area. Fountain is a success story. We have some starts coming in. It was one of our urban villages that was dormant, as was Samish Way. And thanks to the housing authority, we're about to get one of our keystone buildings on the other end. We've got one on the end near Walgreens that actually is showing what that area can develop over time. And finally, we're working with uh, Barclay to develop an official urban village plan. And they've made a commitment to provide a broad range of housing choice. So very, very exciting opportunities there. So there's a lot that still needs to be done. 
um, and things we need to investigate. Inclusionary zoning is something that comes up all the time. Why aren't, we were just talking about this morning um, when I first came in, why don't we just require 10% of all new development? Well, um, you can't do a disincentive when you need housing units desperately. You can't create another disincentive. At the same token, if the market can support it and you're building at the scale and volume, you absolutely can require it. So the key is we want to say that of all of the things that are out there for affordability, if you go to the Municipal Research Service Center, they have a great listing of all the tools the city should do. We do all of them but inclusionary zoning. And the reason is our last economic assessment on that said it's not quite ripe yet. Our market hasn't matured to the point we're building in big enough volumes to do that. Um, it would be a disincentive for construction. And believe me, we're going to keep monitoring it because we are going to pass that point where um, either through incentive or other means, it's a great way of getting units on the ground throughout the area. Um, I talked about underutilizing some of our zoning when we see residential multi, and we see it going to single family when it can hire, carry higher units. We're gonna look to establish density minimums. Um, folks, if we agreed that this was the area to have those types of housing, we should be darn sure we get it. And finally, um, you know, parking is one of those things that it's one of the most controversial issues we work with. Um, virtually every uh, contested permit before our hearing examiner starts with parking issues and traffic. Um, however, I think we all know if it's some other community, lessening the parking standards will increase affordability significantly. Um, if we're successful, and we have been as a community with a multimodal approach, our bike master plan won an award, not just for the plan, but for the way we're implementing it. We may all dispute um, how we designed the bikeway on Chestnut. We'll get that right, I promise. I, I think Chris Como's camping out there in a little tent and observing how the bicyclists go. Um, but we are gonna fix that, um, but we're doing it. And it doesn't mean all of you have to ride a bike, though it'd be really great if you did. Um, it means that we have the choice to ride a bike. And once we put the infrastructure in place and we can get a connected network, we can reduce the need for cars somewhat. Can't eliminate it. There are still gonna be people, people who drive, but we could all reduce it. And there's an environmental benefit for us. There's a benefit for us. We can eliminate some of our parking requirements. We can get the critical mass we need in urban villages. Um, and it's good for you, um, which is a good thing. So I want to thank you for taking this opportunity. I also hope I set Michael up a bit by giving sort of the context of Bellingham and what Bellingham's doing, and I'll stick around for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. That was a great setup. We, ha we have the same conversations in Vancouver. Um, but our, I think our affordability challenges are, are just that much more acute. In a, in a city with a metro population of about 2.4 million people and a very tiny land base. I mean, those of you who've been to Vancouver know that we're bordered by the mountains to the north, by the Pacific to the west, by the US border to the south, uh, the world's 12th largest river flowing through the middle of it, and the, an agricultural land reserve that uh, somebody sensibly um, approved in the 70s, um, taking out you know, a huge portion of the valley for, from housing for class one agricultural use. So um, our, our, we have the same challenges in Vancouver. Um, we, I'm hearing the same solutions, um, the same imperatives for, for density, but density done well. And I think what Vancouver offers, I brought a couple of books if you're interested, some of the, the, the books that inspire me, people who I've worked with. Um, what Vancouver has to offer in terms of the urban story for North America is this counterintuitive idea that you can actually have more livability with more density. Um, in, in a way, I think maybe Vancouver's been a, a, a bit of a victim of its own success because a lot, the world is moving there. You get 1,400 people a year moving to Bellingham. We have 40,000 people a year moving to Greater Vancouver. It's not going to stop, uh, uh, no matter what. Uh, internal in migration from uh, from within Canada, uh, international migration. <clears throat> um, yeah. So our, prob our our affordability problems are quite acute in Vancouver, um, as they are here. I mean, I, I stopped for a coffee on the way in, and I heard I heard two guys talking about how their rent has gone up. 
in Bellingham by, you know, by 10%, 20%. The same thing in Vancouver. Rents are sky high. Um, land, land costs are sky high. So I'll give you a little talk uh, about sort of density done right from, from our perspective in Vancouver. Yeah, so as Rick, uh, Rick has aptly set, set me up uh, in terms of the context for Bellingham, um, I think I'm aware and you're aware of the, uh, the increasing cost of housing, um, increasing demands f for housing. And um, as I said, the same, the same problem exists in Vancouver. In terms of my talk, I think what I wanted to do is maybe talk a little bit about regional planning, how it influences the need for density in Vancouver, some lessons from Vancouver's downtown. And as Rick said, you know, you look in the older parts of our city, you can find examples of what we need for the future, things we need to start doing more of that we used to do in terms of accommodating people. And so there's some lessons from Vancouver's streetcar suburbs that I thought I'd share. And then our big, our big challenge, like yours, is sort of um, what do you do with all the, the post-war suburbs that, um, that have sprawled through the region? So retrofitting those, how do, we, how, do we, um, how do we treat those? How do we zone them? How do we plan them, redevelop them moving forward? Because we know they're low density, they're not economically sustainable, environmentally sustainable, socially sustainable. So my, my perspectives, um, I spent about four years, five years working for the federal government in assisted housing. So for those of you here working in the non-market sector, uh, I, I, know what you're, I, know, I know what your life is like. Um, I manage co-op housing, low-income housing, seniors, First Nations housing, on-reserve, off-reserve housing. Um, I also worked for about five years as a city planner in the major projects department of the city of Vancouver. Uh, and my last project was retrofitting Vancouver's second largest mall into a mixed-use uh, mixed use community. Um, moving over, crossing over from planning to development, I went to go work for Henderson, which is building a, tra a transit-oriented um, community around one of the SkyTrain stations in downtown, including Point Towers, Podium, development with residential uses and retail below. Included in there is a childcare and an elementary school, parks, uh, complete community within the downtown. Um, working for Grosvenor, interesting company, 340 years old, uh, owned by the Duke of Westminster in England. Um, the U.S. Embassy used to sit uh, in, in Grosvenor Square on Grosvenor, Grosvenor land. Uh, funny, the, uh, the U.S. government said, well, listen, you know, do, Duke, you please sell us the land. And he said, well, I'll consider selling it to you if you give me back the 12,000 acres you took from us during the U.S. War of Independence. <laughs> so uh, needless to say, the, the new U.S. Embassy in London is, uh, is now being, it's been built further down the Thames in Nine Elms. And uh, guess who gets back the, uh, the U.S. Embassy? Grover, Grover's got the land lease on it. So, um, but we, in Vancouver, we've been developing, uh, when, I work, when I work for Grover, we've developed all sorts of um, large-scale projects in the city. This one, um, mixed-use, mixed use, large-format mixed-use building, and we decided to add re uh, residential uses on the top, extremely livable and desirable for families. Um, won an award from the Urban Land Institute in 2009. It's about 300,000 square feet. But we used the, you know, a 100,000 square foot rooftop to put row housing on the top, five levels above the city street. It was uh, originally um, zoned for artist live work because it's next to an industrial area and the planners thought maybe it wouldn't be that livable for families. But as it turns out, lots of people brought kids here because of the safety, the security. It has a 20,000 square, square foot green roof, intensive green roof. There's a meter of soil on that. Um, because Home Depot wanted a post-disaster building. You know, If we have an earthquake, Home Depot wants to still be there. And uh, the building is strong enough to support a one meter, one meter green roof. Um, in a row house kind of style. So, you know, really utilizing space that you wouldn't think of for housing is, is sort of the, um, the, uh, the lesson from that. Um, doing projects involving full-scale mixed-use redevelopments of blocks uh, in, in cities around Vancouver. So this is West Vancouver, where we took a waterfront site and developed it um, for luxury housing, not affordable, but quite a nice project. And in London, um, biscuits and beer. So um, everywhere, 
cities are repurposing land for housing for mixed use communities. So in this case, this is the Peak Free and Biscuit Company, uh, founded to provide biscuits for soldiers during the, the uh, Prussian War, um, and then repurposed now, there's a planning application for um, purpose-built rental housing. Uh, that's just along the Thames River, about 12 acres. And in uh, Edinburgh, I worked on uh, re redeveloping a brewery, the McEwen Brewery, again for purpose-built rental uh, at scale. So this is, this is what cities everywhere are doing, reusing industrial land. Um, since uh, since leaving, leaving uh, I Brexited, which was smart, um, given what's happening over there now. Uh, I've been uh, founding my own firm working for uh, the BC government with uh, housing redevelopment for non-market housing, um, BC Transit, the city of Vancouver, and also doing a lot of purpose-built rent, built rental, given that our condo market these days is a little soft, given the sort of government policies, disincenting um, foreign ownership and investment, uh, increasing taxes on housing. So um, a lot of the development industry is moving to rental which is unusual for Vancouver. Uh, as, uh, as Neil mentioned, I'm a director for the Urbanarium, and they have a whole bunch of really interesting programs, some of which I'll talk about in my presentation today. And I'm a member of uh, a director on Small Housing BC, so a number of you took a tour um, yesterday with Jake Fry and my old colleague, Scott Hine. So um, I do work at the small scale as well, promoting uh, affordable housing at, at smaller scales. So Vancouver's lessons. Um, Vancouver in 1927 looked like this. Uh, built out downtown core. Yeah, a built out downtown core surrounded by streetcar suburbs and enormous um, low density suburbs to the south. First city plan in 1927 by uh, the American Harlan Bartholomew. So that, uh, the plan remains pretty much the same. Uh, we haven't really changed the city plan too much, just intensified the downtown, doubling the population in the last 20 years. So there's some lessons there. There are a lot of lessons from the streetcar suburbs that surround the downtown. Um, we know that uh, that area evolved before the city plan, before zoning was put in place. And uh, we see a lot of innovative types of housing there that we could do more of in the, uh, the great suburbs to the south. Um, still connected by great transit lines. Um, it used to be streetcars. Now there are electric buses for the most part. But this area here is uh, very low density. So my, um, my idea is that you know, a lot of the lessons we learned from developing new communities, rebuilding the industrial lands in the down, around the downtown can be transferred or were transferred, some of them, to the streetcar suburbs that surround the downtown. And now, our big question is, in terms of equity, economy, environmental performance, what do we do with 60% of our city that's zoned for single family use? This is a little snapshot of how those areas are performing. So the urban core is about 5% of the land, but houses 17% of our people. The streetcar suburbs that surround the downtown, 15% of the land, but 19% of the people. So both of those areas are overperforming. Um, but everything else, 80% of the land, only 63% of the people. So where are we going to find room and space to house people affordably? Well, we have to look to those areas. That's kind of what the population and the, and the, uh, the areas look like. Very clearly, the outer suburbs are where we need to think about how do we, how do we um, reuse those places. Big problem is equity. If you think your housing prices are high, you should try and buy a house in Vancouver. It's crazy. Um, based on current family incomes, all of this single family RS1 zone is affordable to probably less than 5% of Vancouver households based on income. It's such a disconnect. It's just a, a really powerful disconnect. And people feel it. You hear it at dinner conversations. You hear it all over the place. So the prescription, vitamin D, is my uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, prescription. Vitamin density. Density done well can generate affordability, livability, can house families. Um, and the, pr the precursor is really strong regional planning. And we've been lucky in Vancouver. If you follow Sightline and any of those organizations that track how regions, urban regions perform, Vancouver always performs really well relative to, say, Seattle, uh, Portland, because we have a pretty, um, pretty solid regional 
planning foundation that forces our cities to grow up, not out. So we rejected the freeway in 71, one of the only cities in North America to say no to a big freeway through the center of, the, the, um, center of the city. We have the Agricultural Land Reserve, um, which was passed in 1973, which froze huge tracts of land around the city for agriculture. And we have a regional town center plan. That was really the outcome of the, um, the, the uh, Agricultural Land Reserve Act. So that's what it looks like. We've got city and, um, sorry, regional and provincial um, plans that uh, freeze a lot of the land that outside of the city. All of the cities have to have a regional context plan that supports these official development plans that support the regional context plan, land use bylaws, and in Vancouver, we have discretionary planning, which is very unusual for cities in, uh, in North America, where the director of planning actually has a lot of discretionary power to approve, approve projects, or the development permit board. Council has delegated decision making to either the director of planning or the development permit board. And they have put into the zoning incentives for social amenities, for affordable housing, for childcare, all sorts of amenities, cultural amenities, that whereby the, the director of planning or the development permit board or council can bonus and give developers density in return for this type of, these types of amenities. And um, we also have comprehensive development planning, um, purpose-built purpose plans for specific sites. We have a lot of development guidelines because our, our design guidelines are, are so uh, numerous. One of the downsides is we have a ton of guidelines that where staff sometimes <clears throat> at the city level interpret as policy, which is a big, a big problem. So if you want to know about the Agricultural Land Reserve, there's this great quote from uh, Andrew Petter who said, you know, looked at the origins of the Agricultural Land Reserve. The less people know about how sausages and laws are made, the better they sleep at night. So it was a, um, a Christmas sitting of the legislature. A, um, it was a bill that was put on the floor by the opposition, and somehow it passed, which is incredible. Because in, in 1960, the Vancouver region looked like this. This is the Fraser River that runs through the middle. The airport's here. It's downtown, Stanley Park, as big as downtown. Um, really, Vancouver was one big center. Um, New Westminster, the other, very little in between, low density sprawl all around. North Shore really cut off. You have the Lionsgate Bridge in the Second Narrows. Um, a little bit of an old uh, town center with North Vancouver with some high rises, um, but no, no real transit to speak of. 1960. 1972, just before the Land Reserve uh, Act was formed. Um, not much change. A lot of modernist uh, apartment buildings in, in downtown, some more in New Westminster, North Vancouver. 1974, huge pieces of land taken out of development um, with the land reserve. 86 with Expo, the Transit Expo. This, this brought a SkyTrain um, and light rapid transit. All of a sudden, you started seeing new centers in. Um, in uh, this Vancouver, Burnaby, New Westminster, and some in Surrey, with a line, come, the transit line cuts through the middle, but again, quite compact and no encroachments into the green zone. 92, and this is today. It's quite impressive, actually, for an urban region. Um, this set, this set the, the stage for livable, livable town centers, um, transit-oriented town centers in all the major cities, including Vancouver, North Vancouver, Burnaby, Surrey, Richmond. So we're forced to grow up because we have so little land. So what can we learn from downtown? I think to Rick's point, um, the, we can learn the power of discretionary planning and repurposing old land for new uses. We, uh, we can learn about the power of density and design to create amenity, um, the importance of guidelines, and actually a counterintuitive strategy for redeveloping a downtown, you know, to your point about where should we put families. It was very counterintuitive at the, in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s to say, we're gonna put families downtown. Not many major North American cities did, but, but Vancouver did. 
Because if you can make an area livable for a child, you floated all boats. Streetcar suburbs, um, you can see we see a lot of middle, middle density, relaxed kind of planning, because of course those areas evolved before we had a plan. Um, a lot of innovation, arterial intensification, mixed use, and a lot of infill in our streetcar suburbs. Again, those places built on the dual logic of walking and electric mass transit in 1889. Pretty good for 100 years ago. And then retrofitting our suburbs, I think we, we need to think about ec economic equity, um, a new type of housing. We have these old, old, old houses called Vancouver Specials, which were a sneaky way of getting two houses onto one lot. Um, and we, uh, my argument is we need new Vancouver Specials. We'll talk a bit more about that. And really right-sizing the American dream. So downtown. Um, one of the great books, if you, if you want a reference, is uh, The Vancouver Achievement by John Punter. And John starts talking about that, what I've been talking about before in terms of regional planning, uh, this new political movement that opposed the freeway and said, no, we want a different use for our downtown. Um, and really Vancouver, Vancouver's special discretionary type of planning that gave the Development Permit Board and the Director of Planning considerable power, but also the power to work with communities and, and the public. So 60s, this is uh, a lot of uh, downtown. We had a lot of high-rise buildings uh, built out in the 1960s, sort of modernist slab buildings. But they had a lot of problems. They had surface parking. They didn't have a lot of amenities. Um, when they landed on the ground, there was really not much there, uh, just apartments. Um, and uh, people started uh, reacting negatively to the density, the impacts, the view loss, um, the size of the buildings. And uh, it, through the 70s, these areas were downzoned. Um, considerably until the city figured out how to better shape growth, how to, how to get more amenity out of density. But you could see tremendous appetite for downtown living. Um, this is what Vancouver looked like in the, in the 1970s. Um, huge areas of industrial land un underused around the downtown core and on the North Shore uh, in Coal Harbor. Um, this is until uh, Walter Hardwick uh, came up with a new plan for Fa South Falls Creek and Granville Island. So if you've been to Vancouver, you visited Granville Island, it's fantastic post-industrial redevelopment market, concrete factory, art college, um, market, community centers, and housing all along this area. I was Walter's last graduate student when I was at UBC. He's a mentor of mine, great guy. So that's what it looks like today. Uh, about 40% park, 60% development. Uh, fairly low density, though. But that set the city off on a path of redeveloping neighborhoods throughout the downtown, but redeveloping them for families um, with a considerable focus on amenity for downtown living. Um, Walter, Walter was a sailor, so he, he thought, oh, we have to have a co-op for, uh, for living, liveaboards. Um, lower density housing built on these little beady rings. He was a big fan of Christopher Alexander at the time, so I think that influenced the design. But a lot of townhouse, stacked townhouse development with park, schools, community centers, and local shopping. Similar, I think, Rick, to the, to the villages you're talking about in terms of you know, how do you capitalize on these areas. That's Granville Island, this enormous um, hodgepodge of uses, quite, quite successful to this day. Falls Creek North, uh, after Expo 86, um, this whole area on the North Shore of Falls Creek was redeveloped and planned. Again, but a whole different set of principles and a whole different intensity. We're talking about buildings that are between five and 10 uh, FAR on, the, on this site. Um, but again, a waterfront community. The, um, the purchaser, uh, Li Kaxing from Concord, um, wanted to build out little islands into the, into the Falls Creek and put little exclusive um, high-rises there connected by bridges, and he was politely told, no, you're gonna build us a seawall, you're gonna build parks, amenity, and you'll get density. That's, that's the quid pro quo. Um, you know, livability, density, but amenity is a must. 
That's what it looks like today. Just a necklace of tall buildings um, with lots of amenity parks, um, a seawall that runs the entire length of, of Falls Creek. Um, I lived down here in, 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 the, um, in the 90s and 2000s, early 2000s, uh, with my family. Brought, brought two kids up in, this, in these neighborhoods. Cool Harbor around the same time. This is the north, the north side of the downtown. Uh, again, high density, um, high amenity, lots of, um, lots of housing, and policies that called for 20%, dedication of 20% of the space for housing, for non-market uses. And essentially the deal was um, developers in those big comprehensively planned zones had to, had to set aside 20% of the space. Senior government, namely CMHC and BC Housing, would develop the, the non-market housing as co-op or, low, or uh, low income housing. And finally, Southeast Falls Creek, the last little bit that's being developed uh, was the Athletes Village for the 2010 games. Um, ran into some trouble during the you know, 2008 depression, uh, recession, and um, uh, the city had to take over and finish it out, but it, uh, it, it's been a very successful neighborhood as well too. There, uh, the city went for more of a low-rise form of development, mid-rise actually, uh, for, for instead of the, the towers that you saw on the North Shore. But again, the same mixture of park, amenity, non-market housing mixed with market, um, and a considerable investment in the waterfront. So parking and congestion, congestion's your friend. Because in Vancouver, we've doubled the downtown population through the, through the early part of the 2000s. These are vehicle miles traveled, or number of, tri number of um, vehicle trips per day remain flat. Oh, I've been cut off there. Bike mode, 7.3% in 2018. Five years ago, it was 4.4. Do you know what it takes to move 2% of the, of the mode split? It's, it's huge, it's huge. If you were to put that on transit, it would be millions of dollars of investment to put people into, into buses and, and trains. So this is a huge, this is a huge change for Vancouver. Um, doubling the population of the downtown, but keeping vehicle miles traveled flat, increasing cycling modes, increasing walking, um, increasing transit use, and keeping car use flat. So the systems that work, uh, how do we do this? Uh, we have uh, this discretionary planning system, and it requires a lot of cooperation. It requires amb ambitious political leadership. Um, a really good city manager who can then mediate between the, pl the planning bureaucracy, the political, bu the political direction, engage the public, involve developers, because you, know, you can't really create new housing if you don't include the developers in the equation. A lot of, you get to hear a lot of cynicism from the public about developers, but the fact is the home you're living in is built by a developer. Um, and you need to include them in the discussion, plus all the other city departments. That, those gears working, working together will deliver new buildings and neighborhoods, and you can get high density with high livability. Our planning system uh, looks kind of a little like this. You come in, do pre-application -applic pre process, get your application in, huge public notification, so we want to involve the public. We have an urban design panel, because if you're going to do high density, you need high design. And so we have a peer review process, which is uh, unusual for most cities, although a lot of cities have adopted Vancouver's kind of model of peer review. Um, the typical city department reviews, staff report gets kicked out. If it's within existing policy, the director of planning can make a decision, um, including a decision that bonus density for amenities, negotiated contributions. Um, if it's a major permit, it goes to the development permit board. They have discretionary planning power as well, too. And they have public, public it's a public meeting, it's a public hearing, so the public can attend as well. Um, if it's new zoning, new policy, it goes to council with the typical public involvement. So there's the development notification, eight foot by four foot boards, you can't miss it. Urban design panel, uh, peer review, um, and there you get the feedback. Architects get feedback from architects on their project, um, plus some engineers as well too. 
um, and that's a, a there's actually a bylaw that that uh, empowers empowers this in in the process. So we get significant design changes and improvements through the process. Um, development permit board, uh, the three voting members, the directors, the director of planning, director of engineering, and the city manager. There's an advisory panel. So I volunteered for three years on the advisory panel, uh, and they're drawn from development, from the public, um, the applicant, the design team, and the public can speak as well. This really frees up council to set direction and leadership and engages the, the bureaucracy in, in the positive sense of the word to manage, to manage policy. If you have 40,000 people a year moving to the region, you need to create a lot of housing and every application just can't go to council. There's just no way. So um, in terms of Vancouverism, there's a new book out um, by Larry Beasley, who was the director of planning when I was working at the city. It's a great book. Larry talks about um, the city's um, principles for creating new neighborhoods, for creating new housing. There's a copy on the desk at uh, table one there, if anyone wants to take a look. But Larry talks about taming the car, about um, getting a diversity of uses, the importance of design, environmental responsibility, set, setting high standards for new housing, um, which I, I recognize is a, is a there's a bit of conflict in terms of affordability because you have to pay more sometimes for, for more sustainable buildings, but then also the importance of involving citizens, the private sector, the public sector as well too. And I, you know, I think the experience when I was working at the city with Larry was the sort of if you could plan everything, and you could because you're developing all these new neighborhoods, if you could plan everything, what would you do? And so he, he sets out sort of 10 steps in terms of starting with local structure, integrating streets, natural systems, um, using your, your framework of open spaces, keeping things to a walkable scale, adding jobs, not forgetting to add employment into the mix, looking at school demand, community service demand. To your point about, um, Rick, about you, know, you can't just build density and not service it or else it'll be unlivable. Um, looking at social diversity, setting aside space for 20% non-market housing was, was the city's policy. But then not letting senior levels of government off the hook. You know, we wanted funding from the province and from the federal government. So setting good sustainability targets and really building on local character, site, and in, in, very important in Vancouver views. So a lot of people think of Vancouverism as the point tower and podium that you see downtown. But I think the point here, it's a process. And you can adapt this process for where you're living uh, in terms of your villages, your centers, your open spaces. Um, this is, uh, I helped Larry teach a class this summer with some, uh, some young students uh, looking at urbanism as a career, and there they are applying, a, uh, applying these principles on a theoretical city, 10 minute walking circles. So his, his challenge to them was create a neighborhood of 25,000 people, which is what you're going to have to do, you know, 1,400 a year. <laughs> 10 years is 14,000, you know, in 20 years it's another 30. So, um, and so what, what the outcome of this was with this really counterintuitive idea that you could actually have these very high density downtown environments that were going to be attractive to families. So I was one of those families with my two young kids living downtown. Um, I, I made it into the, the Christmas Day edition of the, Van of the New York Times uh, in this article, uh, spurring, spurring Urban Growth in Vancouver when one family at a time. They contrasted Vancouver with Portland and the downtown, Vancouver's downtown with the Pearl. And, and the, the, the author, Linda Baker, her conclusion was, you know what Vancouver did right? They planned amenities for families. You build it and they'll come. And, um, and that, that was my experience living downtown. I've got a couple places. Yeah, experiential planning. Who are you planning for? When I talk to my students, they'll tell me, oh, the uh, young urban professionals, and they'll give you all sorts of psychographics. At, you know, at the end of the day, you're planning for homo sapiens sapiens, you know, the apes that know they know. Um, Larry talks about citizens as consumers of the city, and really as developers, as planners, um, as, housing as housing experts, we need to deliver uh, on people's needs. Uh, as I said, meet the needs of kids in, in all the communities you build, and, and you'll float all boats. Incorporate beauty and love. Inspire love of the city wherever you build. But really, don't forget that you're building for prime. You're, you're, building, you're building for Homo sapiens sapiens, for, yeah, fundamentally pri sophisticated primates. 
grassland, savanna animals. So um, it, you look at uh, resources for, for doing that. There's uh, my friend Jan Gell. I spent a week with him in Copenhagen. Um, his, his wife's a psychologist. He's an, he's an architect. And uh, he really kind of applies this sort of anthropological approach to design. And he talks about, about um, protection, comfort, and delight when you're looking at the, the intimate scale of, of, de of design. So what do you focus on? You know, clearly the first four levels for where, where it matters. Developers know this. You spend money on what you touch. And really, people, when they're walking through the city, they focus on the first four levels. We know this from urban design. So spend money on those first four levels. Pay a lot of attention to what happens in those first four levels. Active uses. Um, when you're doing mixed use, uh, try and have um, lots, of, lots of variety. Um, friendly spaces, transparency, and light. These are all kind of standard urban design things. And, um, and really understand people, uh, you know, in terms of when you're building out in, in areas where you're doing more density, more intensity, and more proximity of uses. If you've got residential uses and, and semi-public space, um, don't put them on the same level. I know accessibility codes are driving us to that, but you need to elevate, you need to elevate the first floor because really the homo sapiens sapiens doesn't like to sleep on the floor with the lions and the tigers. They like to be a little higher, the light green, so the importance of landscaping, um, of some, some vertical separation. These are some really simple urban design um, strategies that Vancouver's used for its downtown, where you're putting incredible density of, of uh, development up against public thoroughfares, public streets, public sidewalks. Um, a list of the things that we look at in terms of um, of design, compatibility and fit, livability, um, open space, we have standards for open space, um, neighborliness, safety and security. The deal with the density in Vancouver, to your point about parking, is it goes under or you don't get it, like you hide the parking. And right now I'm, I'm working with clients who are looking at 40 story buildings downtown with zero parking, none. And the city is taking us up on it. Actually, we have to do 11 spaces for handicapped use, but zero parking. Lots of bicycle parking, but zero parking. Um, we, all, we, know, we, know, we know how to do density at scale really well. We know all the criteria. And it shows. If you look at the quality of the streets, uh, what, what Vancouver did was, was steal the idea of the Victorian row house and put it at the base of all their buildings. So you have doors, eyes on the street, um, and again, lots of landscaping. Who are you building for? Homo sapiens sapiens, right? They love, we love greenery. We love, we love light. We love uh, movement. We love color. Um, and this, you can achieve this in the highest density downtown core. I think this is Richard Street downtown. Little stoops, patios. They're not used terribly much, but they're important for, for, for their function. And if you notice there's some elevation grade change. We know how to do these. We know how to do this. We got this. Um, marina side, again, you're seeing sort of the, the intensity of development, 5 to 10 FAR. That's a roundhouse community center. Um, local shopping, the importance of grocery stores. Uh, again, a waterfront location. Seawall. There's a school. That's a co-op. Again, part of the 20% set aside for, for, for non-market housing. And that's what it looks like on the ground. Urban fair, grab a coffee, grab a donut, get some groceries. There's a Starbucks just down there. Community center right over here, waterfront. Um, this is an area where I lived on Alberni Street. Again, high density, lots of, lots of uh, leafy green cover, townhouses on the street front public art, water features, and really the, 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 the strategy is to get 80 feet between buildings, have slender towers, about 80 feet by 80 feet. Uh, the height in the downtown is 300 feet, so you can, and, and frequently more if you're in, in an in a area where that, that can accommodate it. 
we uh, we have view corridors, and again a base of row houses at the at the um, at the bottom. But really, um, we're looking at efficient towers, and um, and making sure that each of these all of these buildings have amenity inside as well too for the sort of semi-private shared amenity for for residents. That's the typical Vancouver Point Tower podium. View corridors, we consider those as well too. Um, because views are a public amenity. So uh, room for flexibility um, and improvement. Uh, I, f I find today people, developers will tell us that uh, guidelines are becoming too prescriptive. Um, sometimes there's conflicting city interests uh, in terms of uh, demand for affordability, but then also um, imposition of uh, bedroom and space standards. Looking at the, even the habits of developers and what they, they consider you know, um, essential in, in new, new designs. I think we have to think, rethink some of our own habits when we, when we design places. And the other one that's really um, killing us is now is a city appetite for fees and amenities. So this, the community amenity cont contribution, <laughs> which is not a contribution, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a requirement. But those, those have increased. When I'm looking at space uh, for, for designing smaller, you can't design small spaces the same way you design big spaces. So I like to think of a Swiss Army knife that has multiple uses. Um, and I think this idea of the square, square feet hours, you know, when you look at a, a smaller apartment, it has, to, it has to perform differently. So um, yeah, too many guidelines. So right now there's a big guideline review that uh, Vancouver's doing. Permit, permit times are a real challenge in Vancouver as well. When I was working in planning, we could get a major project through development permit in, in a year. Today, it's taking 16 months, 18 months um, because of the volume. That was the, th those are the guidelines in 1956, and these are the guidelines in 2018. So, uh, similar story. Um, market habits, you know, uh, I look at the design of smaller apartments, and I, I, I wonder what my colleagues are doing. You know, 38% of this is eight hour space. It's two bedrooms, big walk-in closet. Um, Smaller, build, smaller units need to perform differently. Like, do we really need walk-in closets? Do we really need two bathrooms in a two-bedroom? Or two full bathrooms? Um, how can you make 800 square feet work like 1,000? Well, maybe you reorganize the space. You make use of better furniture. Um, take out the, the walk-in closet and give people some flexibility about how they use it. You can turn that space into this space, where it's three quarters of it is sort of 24 hour space, maybe one quarter of it is just that eight hour space. We have to think about design a little differently because people are living smaller. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, uh, average, pr uh, average prices now for Vancouver, $1,000 a square foot for, for an apartment. So, you know, an 800 square foot apartment is $800,000. It's just crazy. So, you know, the degree to which you can get people to get better use out of their apartments, that's part of the affordability challenge. Old ideas, um, we need to be new th thinking about old ideas. So a favorite of mine is Christopher Alexander's pattern language. He says, why, is, why do we have one idea of a bedroom, you know? Um, he says, like, and throughout history, we've had all these different types of bedrooms. So huh. This is uh, Potsdam Palace in Berlin, uh, I think queen or a king, somebody slept in that little alcove. Nice, nice digs. Thomas Jefferson in Monticello, slept in a, he slept in an alcove, he slept in an alcove, a hallway between two rooms. Good enough for presidents, good enough for all sorts of interesting ways of organizing space. Um, kind of interested in this, I used to do this London to Edinburgh on the, on the train. And then you can find bedrooms that mimic that as well, too. So making, making use of small spaces. You can't design small the way you design big. And uh, yeah, so square feet hours, how to make 800 square feet work like 1,000. Um, lots of interesting things now emerging in the marketplace, too. This is resource furniture out of Vancouver. All sorts of great, amazing furniture. Wow. Flips out, beds that flip out, wall beds. Movable wall system, so Ikea's prototyping a movable wall system. Um, you see this in some design magazines, floating storage, robotic walls. There's a bunch of them there uh, where you can actually transform rooms with a flick of a switch. Yeah. Um, let's revise planning rules pragmatically. 
in Vancouver, we've, we've got um, ha habitable light regulations that require all bedrooms to have a, a window access and, and ventilation. And I think a lot of developers are saying, well, could you, if it's a three bedroom unit, could you, could you allow us to do one inboard bedroom? It'll save 20% of the area of the apartment if we can put one bedroom inboard and have borrowed light, borrowed ventilation. After all, what are you doing in there? Sleeping. So, so that's the difference. Um, it's part of the conversation. Some cities are allowing it, some aren't. But really, uh, in terms of affordability, it's like learning how to do compact design well. Uh, in this case, you've got two bedrooms with an outside wall. In this case, you've got one of them with an, that's inboard. Not the best location in this, in this uh, example. But um, we know there are ways of designing smaller apartments better. City fees are a big problem. This was an interesting study that Altus did. A Vancouver high rise, of the cost of a high rise, $154,000 in fees. That represent almost 15% of the cost of the, of the unit. So we really have to start thinking about um, the, city, the, the impact of city fees. In Canada, um, the federal government charges 5% goods and service tax on a new apartment. Thank you very much for your contribution to affordable housing. And if you're, if you're now the purchaser pays that. If you're doing purpose-built rental in Canada and you're the developer, you pay the 5% as the developer. So again, a disincentive, really. Streetcar suburbs, um, these are the kind of middle density zones, mixed use. They evolved before the city plan. Here's Harlan Bartholomew. But you know what? He's 130 years old, and he's still telling us how to live. So he saw, he saw these areas as uh, negative zones of transition where people were infilling with multifamily, was undesirable. So he froze everything outside of those zones as single family. But in fact, these neighborhoods today are some of the leafiest, most desirable neighborhoods to live in Vancouver. I would much rather live in this zone than out here, for sure. Close to shops, close to services, close to the downtown. Um, this is a streetcar-led development in, in 1914. This is Kitsilano. It's crazy <laughs> how fast the city grows. Uh, that's Bartholomew. Bartholomew did tons of plans all over North America. He did a bunch for Vancouver. Uh, and this was his this was his uh, his statement. Had it been for the widespread, had it not been for the widespread intrusion of commercial and industrial uses and the building of multiple dwellings in single family residential districts just after World War One, before he did his city plan, um, the uh, town planning would have been delayed for several years in Vancouver. The encroachment of apartments and retail stores, the latter almost extending to the street line, were the worst offenders. These are the best places to live in Vancouver today. Um, so that was the streetcar system in, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, electric mobility and walking. I mean, at the turn of the century, a uh, pretty fantastic recipe for a city. Around those nodes where all the streetcars inter intersected, we had uh, neighborhood nodes, local shopping, downtown densified pretty quickly. But these are the, we have 26 of these throughout the city. We don't have any malls. We have two malls in all of Vancouver. And we have lots of these local shopping areas, perfect for, for walkable communities, perfect for intensification. That's kind of what the retail scene looks like in Vancouver today, arterial retail with, uh, again, these spots of uh, local shopping. Uh, Scott Hine, who you went on tour with yesterday, he, he came up with this idea of uh, this, a city of five-minute neighborhoods based on, on, on these local shopping areas, looking at different types of intensification within a five-minute walk of all these zones. This is where we're headed. Um, this is a friend of mine, Harold Kalki, who built a, what was called a Capers building in, I think, in, 1990, in the 1990s, 2.5 FSR. It's now Whole Foods down here. David Suzuki Foundation has its offices here. Heat, ground source heat pump, all sorts of interesting stuff in the early 90s, um, but you know, reasonable density. Um, we applied those, the lessons of, of the inner city, new neighborhoods to the redevelopment of old industrial areas in the streetcar suburbs. This is Arbutus Walk. Lots of uh, mid-rise buildings mostly condos, 
And then we're looking at gentler forms of density, much like you. Um, we're looking at, these are the old houses in, in Kitsilano, and we're looking at multiple types of, multiple forms of infill. Um, we don't really have single family zoning anymore in Vancouver, because back in the 90s, council allowed secondary suites, and, uh, and then in the 2000s, they started allowing us uh, laneway homes, but not subdividable, not for sale, but for rent. It's that coach house. Um, but in Kitsilano, they, they did experiment with ownership um, subdivision. So you have strata lot for a main floor, strata lot for a second unit, and the coach house in the back. So you can get three units out of one, one suburban lot with uh, limited, limited common property for access. More attention to details, same thing with these coach houses. Two minutes. Um, this one's the design by Paul Merrick. It can be really lovely livable places with lots of light, even though they're at the back of the house. Uh, interestingly, Merrick was uh, living on a boat when he designed this, so you can tell. <laughs> um, small, uh, small works, we're looking at lots of new infills. So Jake Fry, who you also went on tour with, I think yesterday, some of you went on tour with yesterday. That's his company. They're just busy doing about 40 or 50 of these a year in the city. Be beautiful little laneways. Uh, and then tons more infill options in, in these, suburb in these uh, streetcar suburbs. But basically, the next check, the next task, look, retrofitting suburbs. And really, this is the, I love this out of Doug Kelbach. Europe has its cafes, America has a bathroom. We need more espresso, less plumbing. Um, so if you go to the Ur Urban Area website, uh, they hosted a missing middle competition. So this, the results of that are, are, are available there. Um, I've, I left you the link. Uh, we're looking at middle forms of density that can provide some affordability. Um, that was the winner. And there, it's looking for a home. So that'll be a pilot project. Um, the city of Vancouver's uh, got an affordable, um, moderate income rental housing program where they're bonusing density in return for affordable rental. Land is just crazy. I mean, when I left for, for London in 2013, land was $250 a buildable square foot in the city center. When I came back in 2016, more than 500 a square foot buildable. So it doubled in three years. So uh, density is the, way to, is the way to deal with that. If you bonus the density in return for affordability, you're going to get some, some, some affordable rentals. This is what's on the agenda now for council. And then finally, uh, with Small Housing BC, we're looking at um, a, permanent, a permanently affordable home ownership program that uses density bonuses for single lots to create um, affordable housing. Again, the, the trade-off is give us some extra density, we'll develop, we'll can, we can develop a unit at a, at a low cost and keep it perpetually affordable. Um, and this was our fun uh, urbanarium, urbanarium event a few, a few months ago. The single family zone is dead. So uh, we had, I had everyone fill in a tax, I gave everybody a tax form that was statistically correct. It's randomly distributed incomes and then had everyone stand up if they could afford a house. So um, I won't get into the, the income details, but here's a one and a half million dollar house. Requires gross household income of $187,000. <clears throat> Median income in Vancouver for a family is 80,000. So this is the reality. This is a teardown house on the east side um, back when things were peaky. The price has come down now, maybe at 1.2, 1.3 million, but still way out of line. So what if you did a fourplex? If you, if, if you redeveloped it as a fourplex for three million bucks, um, lot in, hard costs in, and sold everything for 750,000, Gross, gross annual income needed $93,000. You've solved a big problem by cutting that cake. And my idea is, let's, let's get a new Vancouver special. That's the old special from the 60s where somebody put a kitchen down here and a kitchen up there and as a sneaky way of getting two units on one lot. We need a new Vancouver special. You know, we need to, we need to cut that in a few different ways. Maybe look at more density. Um, slice it differently, but still keep the leafy street frontage, still keep the big gardens. So it's like cutting a cake. That's what that cake costs today. One and a half million bucks. What do you need? You need about $227,000 under those assumptions. If you cut it four ways, it comes 
a little more affordable. And currently, if you want to eat that cake on your own, only 5% of households are going to be able to afford to live in the suburbs of Vancouver. That occupies 60% of our land base. I think we should be going for something that's a little more equitable. You know, let's look at our zoning, let's look at our density, and find a way of making sure that 60% of our land can accommodate 60% of our households. It's a big economic equity pro um, challenge. My cat likes it. <laughs> Yeah, so the lessons are transferable. I'll just close here. That, you know, what we learned from redeveloping the downtown, we applied in our streetcar suburbs. What we learned in our streetcar suburbs, we can apply to our, to our outer suburbs with gentle forms of infill that maintain livability, that maintain amenity, that engage the public in terms of, you know, planning um, and bonusing, for, bonusing density in return for amenity and affordability. That's Vancouver's big challenge. Thanks for your time.